from Miami Beach, Florida, it's theCUBE, covering Acronis Global Cyber Summit 2019. Brought to you by Acronis. Okay, welcome back everyone. This is CUBE's coverage here at Acronis' Global Cyber Summit 2019. It's their inaugural event around cyber protection. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We're talking to all the thought leaders, experts, talking about the platforms. We've got a great guest here, security analyst, author, and TED speaker, Karen Elzari, who runs the B-Sides Tel Aviv. Um, she gave a keynote here. Welcome to theCUBE. Thanks for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Love to have you on. Security obviously is hot. You've been on that wave. You've been talking a lot about it. You gave a talk here at yes, the Yes, right this morning. Mm -hmm. um, but Forrest, before we get into that, I want to get in and explore what you've been doing at B-Sides Tel Aviv. This is a global community. Absolutely. Tel Aviv runs so, Cyber Week, you wrote a big thing there. So that's something that's really important to me. So 10 years ago, hackers and security researchers starting, started something called Security B-Sides, which was an alternative community event for hackers that couldn't find their voice and their space in the more mainstream events like RSA Conference or Black Hat, for example. That's when Security B-Sides was born 10 years ago. Now it's a global movement and there's been more than 100 B-Sides events just this year alone, just in 2019. Anywhere from Sao Paulo to Cairo, Mexico City, Athens, Colorado, Zurich, London, and in my hometown of Tel Aviv, I was very proud to bring the B-Sides idea and concept to Tel Aviv five years ago. Uh, this year, 2020, will be our fifth year and will be, our, I hope, our biggest year yet. Last summer, we had more than 1,200 yeah. participants. We take place during something called Tel Aviv Cyber Week, which if you've never visited Tel Aviv, that's your opportunity next year. Tel Aviv Cyber Week brings 9,000 people to Israel. It's hosted by Tel Aviv University, where I'm also a researcher, and all of these events Events are free, they're in English, they're welcoming to people from all sorts of places and all walks of life. We bring people from more than 70 countries. And I think it's great that we can have that platform in Israel, in Tel Aviv, to share not just our knowledge, but also our points of view, our different opinions about the future of cybersecurity. And it's run by the Tel Aviv University? Yeah, so Tel Aviv University hosts Tel Aviv Cyber Week, and they're also the gracious hosts for Besides Tel Aviv, which runs as a nonprofit separate from the university. You know, I love these movements where you have organic, just organic growth, and and you know, we saw that with the unconference wave a couple Absolutely, years ago yeah. where you know the fancy conferences got too stuffy too sponsor oriented That's right. more marketing pitches yeah. well, people weren't comfortable just yeah. going up there so they want to have more face-to-face, -face More community-oriented conversations. Is that how B-Sides' work is more organic? Yeah, so B-Sides, actually, the first one was absolutely an unconference, and to this day, we maintain some of that vibe, that important community aspect of providing a stage for people that really may not have the opportunity to speak at Black Hat or here or there. They may not feel comfortable on a huge stage with all those lights on them, so we really need to have yeah. that community aspect for them. And believe it or not, an unconference is how I got on the TED stage, because a producer from TED actually came all the way to Israel to an unconference in the northern city of Nazareth in Israel and she was sitting in the room while I was giving a talk yeah. to 15 people in the lobby of a hotel <laughs> and it wasn't that it wasn't you know I didn't have a big projector yeah. it wasn't a fancy uh, production on any scale but that's where that TED producer found me and my perspective and decided that this this sort of point of view deserves to have a bigger stage. Yeah, now with digital technologies the lobby conference we call it the lobby con. Lobby con. All the yeah. actions in the hallways it's always kind of because the you have a program, it's not about learning anymore at these events because it's all you can learn online, it's a face-to-face -face communal activity. I think, I think it's the difference between people talking at you to people talking with you. And that's why I'm very happy to give talks and I'm here focused on sharing my point of view, but I also want to focus on having conversations with people and that's what I've been doing this morning, sharing my point of view, teaching people about how I think the security world could look like, learning from them, listening to them, and it's really about creating that sort of an atmosphere. You know, there's a lot of tension right now in the security space. I want to get your thoughts on this because you know, I have my personal passion is I really believe that communities is where the action is and a lot of problems mm. can be solved mm. if tapped properly, mm -hmm. if, they weren't, if they're not used, or if, they're, if the collective intelligence of a community can be harnessed. Yes, absolutely. And I think the security community right now has an imperative mandate which is there's a lot of to good, do that, better, I think. good that could be happening. Mm. The adversaries are at scale. You're seeing um, you know, zero day out there, you got digital warfare going on, you've got all kinds of things on a national, global scale mm. happening, and, I, and people are worried. 
Absolutely. You know, so there's, there's, injections, there's, there's just, a lot of fear. There's a lot of panic uh, going on these days. If you're an average individual, you hear about cybersecurity, you hear about hackers, you're thinking, oh my God, I should turn all of my devices off, go live in the woods with some sheep, and that's going to be my future. Otherwise, I'm at risk. And I agree with you, it's the responsibility of the security industry and the security community to come together and also harness the power and the potential of the many friendly hackers out there, friendly hackers such as myself, security researchers, and not all security researchers are working in a lab at a university or in a big company, and they might want to you know, be wherever they are in the world, but still contribute. This is why I talk about the hacker's immune system, how hackers can actually contribute to an immune system, helping us identify vulnerabilities and fix them. And in many cases, I've found that it's not just the friendly hackers, even the unfriendly ones, even the criminals, have a lot to teach us. And we can actually not afford not to pay attention, not to be really more immersed, more closely connected with what is happening in the hacker's world, whether it's the criminal hackers underground or the friendly hackers yeah. who get together at community events, who share their work, who participate on bug bounty platforms, which is a big part of my personal research work yeah. and my passion. Uh, yeah. Bug bounty programs, for the viewers who are not familiar with it, are frameworks that allow companies that you might rely on, like Google or Facebook, United Airlines yeah. or Starbucks, or any company that you can imagine, so many big companies now have bug bounty programs in place, allowing them to actively reward individual hackers that are identifying vulnerabilities. Yeah, and they pay a lot of money too, up to millions of dollars. Yes, for they do, but bounty. it's not just about the money, you know, John, it's not just the amount of money. Uh, there's all kinds of other rewards in place as well, uh, whether it's a fancy, you know, a t-shirt or a sticker, yeah. or in the case of Tesla, for example, they give out challenge coins, challenge coins that only go out to the top hackers that work with them. Now, you can't buy anything with these challenge coins, you can't, tra you can't trade them in in the store for money. But what you can do is that you get a lot of reputational and you know unmonetary value out of that as well. Additionally, you know, another organization that's called them the Pentagon has a similar program. So the Pentagon is giving out not just monetary rewards, but challenge coins for hackers that are working with them. This reputation kind of system is really cutting edge, and I think that's a great point. Mm -hmm. um, I personally believe that that will be a big movement in all community behavior, because when you start getting into having people arbitrate between who's reputable, mm -hmm. That's an incentive beyond money. Well, what I've I mean, found money's great, I guess, but like reputation also is important. I too. can tell you this because I've I've this I've really dissected and researched this in my uh, academic work, and I've looked at the data from several bug bounty programs and the data that was available. There's all kinds of value on the table. Some of the value is money, and you get paid. And you know, last month I heard about the first bug bounty millionaire, and he's a guy from Argentina. But the value is not just in the money; it's also reputational value. It's also work. Value. Value. So some hackers, some security researchers just want to build up their resume and then they get job offers and they start working for companies that may have never looked at them before because they're not graduates of this and that school, didn't have this or that upbringing. We have to remember that from, from the global perspective, not everybody has access to you know, the American school system or the Israeli school system. They can't just sign up for a college degree in cybersecurity or engineering if they live in parts of the world where that's not accessible to them. But through being a researcher on the bug bounty pl platform, they gain up their experience, they gain up their know-how, and then companies want to work with them and want to hire them. You've so that's contributing that the to the, you've what's seen this, You've seen this written yeah, in your research. Yeah, we've seen this, and the reports are showing this, the data is showing this, all of the bug bounty programs ha have reports that come out that show this information as well. You see that the hackers on bug bounty pla platforms are usually under 30, a lot of them are under 30, they're young people, they're making their way into this industry. Now let me tell you something, when I was growing up in Israel, and I was a young hacker, I didn't know any bug bounty programs. None of that stuff was around. Granted, we also didn't have a cyber crime law, so anything I did wasn't officially illegal because okay. we didn't have, we didn't necessarily have, yeah. It wasn't That's good, experimentation's good. It certainly was, and I was very driven by yeah. curiosity. But the point I'm trying to make is that I didn't actually have a legal, legitimate alternative to you know, the type of hacking that I was doing. There wasn't any other option for me until it was time for me to serve in the Israeli military, which is where I really got my chops. But for people living in parts of the world where they don't have any legitimate legal way to work in cybersecurity, Previously, they would have turned to criminal activities, to using their know-how to make money as a cyber criminal. Now that alternative of being part of a global immune system is available to them on a legitimate legal 
pathway, and that's really important for our workforce as well. A lot of people will tell you that cybersecurity workforce needs all the help it can get. There's a shortage, there's a talent gap. A lot of people talk about the talent gap. I believe a big part of the solution is going to come from all of these hackers all over the world that are now accessing the legitimate legal world of cybersecurity. I think you're really onto something. I want to uh, amplify that. And certainly, uh, after this interview, I'd love to follow up with you. Certainly, we will come to Tel Aviv. It's on our list for the Cube stop. Fabulous. We'll be there. We'd love to host um, in Tel Aviv. I think reputation, what you're talking about, is an unforeseen democratization, positive impact of the world. Mm. I want you to just take a minute to explain how this all came together for the with your view on this reputational thing. And talk about the impact. Where does it go beyond just reputational for jobs? What, how does a community flex and, and, and organically grow from this impact? So one thing that I'm very happy to see, I think in the past couple of years, the, the reputations generally of hackers have become important and that the concept of a hacker is not what we used to think about in the past where we would automatically go to somebody who's a criminal or a bad guy. Did you know that the Girl Scouts organization, the US Girl Scouts, are now teaching Girl Scouts to be hackers. They're teaching them cybersecurity skills. Yeah. Arguably, I would claim, yeah. this is a more important skill than making cookies or you know, selling cookies. Yeah. Uh, certainly a you more important- You gotta learn how to survive in the wilderness, and why not the digital wilderness? Yes. Making a fire, uh, counter- More than that, know. more than that, it's about service. Yeah. So the Girl Scouts organization has always been very dedicated yeah. to values of service. Yeah. Imagine these girls, they are now becoming very knowledgeable about cybersecurity. They can teach their peers, their families, so they can actually help spread a more, you know, build a more secure world. Certainly they could probably start a fire or uh, track a rabbit in the forest or whatever it is that Girl Scouts used well, to do. Well, they do that digitally too. That's called, you know, the yes, tracing. They yes, they could So uh, you're really a motivating uh, person, uh, I think, as, uh, aspiring to many young women. Thank you, that's I very kind really of you. I'm really passionate to have more voices out there. What can we do differently? What how, what can I do as a guy, as in the industry? I have two daughters, everyone has, as they get older, I have daughters, of course they care now, but most men want to help. What yeah. can we do as a group? So I think you're absolutely community? right that diversity and inclusivity within the te technology workforce is not a problem that just the underrepresented groups need to solve, right? It's actually an issue for the entire group to solve, whether it's men or women, or any underrepresented minority and overrepresented groups as well. Because diversity of the workforce will actually help build a more resilient, sustainable workforce, it will help with that talent gap, that shortage of people, of skilled employees that we mentioned. Uh, there's a few things that you can do. I personally decided to do what I can, so I contributed to a book called Women in Tech, A Practical Guide. Uh, in that book, there's also a chapter for allies, so if you're a, a person that wants to uh, help a woman or women in tech in your community, you are very welcome to check out the book. It's on Amazon, Women in Tech, A Practical Guide. I'm a contributor to that myself. I also started a group called Lead Cyber Ladies, which is a global meetup for women in cybersecurity, and we have chapters and events in Israel, in New York City, in Canada, and soon, I believe, in United Kingdom and Silicon Valley. And perhaps in yep. your company or in your community, you could help start a similar group, or maybe you know encourage some of the ladies that you know to start a group, help them by finding a space, creating a safe environment for them to create meetups like that, by yeah. providing resources, by sponsoring events, by mentoring. Yeah. Uh, there's a few, a lot Just of things. Just get started. That do something. Yeah. Yeah, there's there. a lot of things that you can do and it's certainly most important to consider that diversity in the workforce is everybody's issue. It's not something yeah. just one gender or one group needs yeah, to take care of. And starting a group doesn't have to be a big bang theory. You can start with three people, two people. Absolutely. And just have an organic growth. It could be yeah. small and then and you can... Yes, certainly. And as men, if you don't want to you know, start an event for women because that may seem disingenuous, what you can do is certainly encourage the women that you find around you in your workforce to see if they want to maybe uh, have a, a meetup and if they do, what kind of help you can offer. Can you run the AV for them? Can you uh, sponsor the croissants? Whatever kind of help that you can offer to create that sort of a space. The reason we, we started Cyber Ladies is because I didn't see enough women speaking yeah. at security events. So I wanted to create a meetup where the women in cybersecurity could share their work, network with one another, and really build up also their speaking port portfolio, yeah. their speaking powers, so that they can really feel more comfortable at speaking and sharing their work on other events and as well. And some good camaraderie there too. It's good yes. community. It's very important. Uh, awesome Indeed. work that you're doing. Doing. What's Thank you so exciting much. you now? What is uh, on your your uh, professional and personal interests these days? Yeah. What's getting you excited? So what are some of the cool things you're looking at? That's a fantastic question. So one thing I'm super excited about uh, is that I'm actually collaborating with my sister. So my sister, believe it or not, is a lawyer. 
and she's a lawyer who's specializing in cyber law, in intellectual property, privacy, security policy work, and I'm collaborating with her to create a new book, which would be a guide to the future of cybersecurity from the hacker's perspective and the lawyer's perspective, because we are seeing a lot of regulators, a lot of companies that are now really having to follow laws and guidelines and regulations around cybersecurity, and we re really want to bring these two points of view together. We've already collaborated in the past, and in fact, my sister has worked on the legal terms of many of the bug bounty programs that I mentioned earlier, including wow. the Tesla program. So it's very exciting and very proud to be able to work with my younger sister who followed me into the cyber world. I'm the hacker, she's the lawyer, and we're creating something wow, together. Wow, what a dynamic duo that's going to be. I'm excited to yes. interview her. Yeah, so in my family we call her the turbo version. Can you imagine <laughs> that? Together, it's really unstoppable. We did, have, we did have a chance to speak together at the RSA conference uh, earlier this year, and that was really unique, and we're going to follow up on that with the book. Well, our platform is your platform. Anything so we can do to help you. you get the word out. Super exciting work that you're doing. We think cyber community will be um, one of the big answers to some of the challenges I out absolutely there. Agree. And we need more education. Lawmakers and global politicians have to get more tech savvy. Yes, this absolutely. Is big, everybody, big it's everybody's issue. Like I said in this morning's speech, everybody's on the front lines. It's not the cyber generals or you know the hackers in the basements that are fighting. We are on that digital battlefront and we all have to be safer together. Karen, thanks for your great insights here and energy. Bug bounties are hot, the community is growing. This is the cyber conference here, the uh, Acronis Global Cyber Summit 2019. I'm John Furrier. Be back with more coverage after this short break.